Damascus Road podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. So about this time last year, uh, my husband Tyler completed his Master of Divinity degree, which was a five-year long process in which he had been working full-time, being a student, and caring for our family. It is a wonderful achievement, and I'm very, very proud of him. And one of the unexpected benefits of Tyler doing a theological degree is that we could talk about what he was learning way more than when I was in grad school. My master's degree is in public health, which everyone knows a little bit about and way more than they want after the pandemic, but it's not the same. Sure, I could complain about my epidemiology class or tell Tyler about a really interesting public health theory application, but it wasn't something that Tyler had directly studied. And while Tyler has obviously done far more work in theological and pastoral studies than I have, it's still ultimately the Bible, so we've at least read the same book. It made conversations about what he was studying far easier for us both to engage in, and I know that I learned a lot too. We talked about what it means to baptize our imaginations, the importance of good art in communicating God's truths, how creation care and Sabbath run together through scripture, and just how awesome C.S. Lewis is. That one came up a lot. But one conversation that really stuck out to me was a story Tyler had read from a black theologian whose mother had refused to read or reference the works of Paul in the New Testament. You see, Paul's words were used by slave owners and supporters of slavery to incorrectly justify this evil practice. Enslaved people were preached to using the word of God to explain why they were in chains. And so this black woman decided that she would never again engage with Paul's words that had hurt so many. And this is a very, very difficult thing to speak into. My knee-jerk reaction as like an educated modern person is to go, oh, no, 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 that's not what Paul meant. Paul's letters are so great. Here's all of my logical arguments out of scripture to tell you exactly why. Or to point out all of the Christians throughout history who have fought against slavery and injustice. Or to do something else just to get out of my own discomfort about this situation. But I have to recognize that my cultural and historical experience is radically different from that of this woman. I have never been enslaved, nor has any of my family. I have not had Paul's words twisted at me to justify why I'm in chains, why I'm subject to the deep cruelty of others, or why my personhood is something to be bought and sold. I have to recognize here that there are several different cultural lenses at play. What Paul actually meant to his audience, how slave owners abused his words, how this black woman was hurt by it, and how I am looking back on this very dynamic history now. There's not easy, comfortable answers here, but it's worth the work to wrestle with God and the Bible and community to work out questions like this. And the Bible is incredible in that even doing the most cursory read can offer us life-giving wisdom and encouragement. But if all we ever do is skim the surface, we're going to miss out on a lot. Even worse, we may misuse or misappropriate scripture, twisting it to fit a world that's convenient and gratifying to us and not actually what God intended for his creation. And doing this can obviously have huge negative consequences, like this woman who who would no longer engage with the words from Paul because of how much they had hurt people in history. Perhaps we are so afraid of this very thing that we avoid the Bible altogether, not wanting to say something wrong or something hurtful. I know I and many others have heard Bible verses used in angry and painful interactions that leave us very frustrated and wondering if Christianity really is all it's cracked up to be. And if we do choose to engage deeply and consistently with scripture, and I very, very much hope that we do, we will find that it's just not always easy to know exactly what is meant right off the bat. I've also heard something to the effect of, well, I don't ever interpret the Bible, I just read it. Um, And that's simply not how reading works. We are always interpreting, always pulling in the narratives and experiences we have to help us make sense of the information that we're taking in. That's not a bad thing. As a 29-year-old white woman in the U.S. with advanced education and a young family, I know I have a specific lens that I bring into reading scripture. Each of you in this room may have has one too, and it may be very similar or very wildly from mine. I can acknowledge that lens and how it impacts my interpretation of scripture, or I can pretend that it's not there and be secretly beholden to it, unable to ever see past its effects. The latter option not only keeps me stuck in one perspective, but it keeps me from seeking out the perspectives of others. 
And this is a real shame, because as it turns out, the Bible was written originally to an audience with a very, very different lens than we have in the modern Western world. Jesus spoke to an audience that had a vastly different history, cultural outlook, and social system than we do. To ignore that is going to cause us to miss out on much of the depth and richness of Scripture. It's like being a tourist in another country versus actually living there. You may learn from both, but only the latter is going to help you develop a real sense of that place. So in this series, we're going to try and be less tourists of Scripture and more residents of it. As a church, we do our best to interpret the Bible as it would have been understood by the original audience in their culture, aligned with the author's intentions guided by God's spirit. We do everything we can to get into the culture, the language, and the context of the Bible so that we can rightly understand and apply it to our lives. And throughout this year, we've been engaging with the practice of prayer from different angles. And so we're going to continue doing that by looking more deeply at the Lord's Prayer together. And you've likely heard this version before, whether in church or just kind of out in culture. The most traditional version is, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And there are many, many sermons, books, podcasts, and you name it, that have taught on this before. And in all likelihood, you've heard this taught on before. So what we want to do today and over the next few weeks is look at this from the lens that Jesus did, teaching first century Jews and Gentiles in Roman Judea. These words, just on their own, may spark something in us, but could there be more here? Do we know what Jesus truly meant when he said, this then is how you should pray, and launched into this beautiful prayer? What exactly would it have been like for Jesus' original audience to hear this, and what does it mean for us now? How can we live out this prayer given to people thousands of years ago in a very different modern world? And today we're going to focus on just the opening lines to this prayer from the New Living Translation. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. But before getting into the Lord's Prayer itself, Jesus actually had some important teaching about prayer in general. We read in Matthew 6, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need before you ask him. Before getting into exactly how to pray, Jesus sets up some guidance on how not to pray. His teaching here implies that the number of words we add to a prayer is less important than actually listening to and being with God. In Jesus' time, there was a cultural assumption across different faiths that a longer prayer was automatically a better prayer, and that if you repeated the right phrases over and over again, you could compel the divine to do exactly what you wanted them to do. And in Rome, where the line between gods and the Roman emperor was pretty blurry, you could see this idea play out in just how a Roman ruler would have been addressed. Here's just one example. The emperor Caesar, Galerius, Valerius, Maximanus, Invictus, Augustus, Pontifex Maximus, Germanicus Maximus, Egypticus Maximus, I'm not done, Phoebicus Maximus, Sarmenticus Maximus, five times, Persecus Maximus, twice, Carpicus Maximus, six times, Armenicus Maximus, Medicus Maximus, Abendicus Maximus, holder of tribunical authority for the 20th time, emperor for the 19th, consul for the 8th, Eighth, Pater Patriae Pro Consul. Thank you. Thank you. I worked hard on that. Uh, and this is how Caesar would have understood himself and how people would have addressed the leaders and gods of the time. This was the standard of respect and worship for this era. But Jesus instead says that God, capital G here, doesn't need or want all of these words. God desires relationship with you. Talk to God, come before him with your needs and questions, but there is no need to try and impress or cajole God with fanciful language and titles. And this was already a problem in Jesus's day, and I think it still speaks to us now. We are drowning in words and visual input. I sometimes think about what it would have been like if I traveled back in time right now, like to Jesus's day or even just like the Middle Ages. And I think the thing that would really get me is just the smell. I would not be prepared for it. But if someone from that time appeared now, I think the amount of noise and visual stimulation would be just deafening. Last week, I watched the concert movie uh, for Taylor Swift's Eras Tour with Tyler, and the production is incredible. Like, I hope Ryan doesn't watch this or he's going to get some really, really ambitious ideas for Sunday, and we just can't do that. 
But there's all these changing sets and costumes and dancers all backing up Taylor Swift, who knows how to put on an incredible show. But can you imagine some poor 12th century farmer just suddenly appearing at a concert like this? I think their ears and maybe their brains would explode. They would not be ready. But even if we're not at stadium tour levels all the time, the amount of sensory information from our phones, computers, TVs, ads, music in the background, and all the rest leave us exhausted. And at the same time, we're all desperate to be heard, to make ourselves known in the world. We keep putting more and more words out there, thinking that if we say enough or the right thing, that we're going to make a difference, that we're going to change their mind, that we're going to win, that we're going to finally be happy and feel loved. But more words and noise just don't seem to be getting us there. And Jesus knows this tendency within us and instead gently guides us towards a different path. Rather than many words repeated over and over to get what we want, Jesus calls his followers to listen, to be with God, and to choose our words with care and intention. He knows that our abundance of words is often a way for us to just cover up our own insecurities, the fig leaves of our false self that Tyler talked about last week in his message. Instead, choose to come before God in prayer as you are. And next, Jesus opens the prayer in a way that I think sounds pretty normal to us now, but would have been scandalous to his disciples. He starts off with this simple, intimate address. Matthew 6, 9, he goes, pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. And this is a far cry from that emperor's address we read earlier. And we can't really see this reading in English, but Jesus kicks off this prayer with the word Abba, the Aramaic word for father or our father. And this is really important for a couple of reasons. First, in Judaism, prayers are done in Hebrew and Hebrew only. It is the sacred language. Even if you spoke something else daily, like Aramaic, a language that was very common in Jesus' time, Hebrew was what you would use for prayer. The relationship uh, now between Islam and Arabic is very similar. People speak many different dialects of Arabic all over across the world, but the Quran is read in Fusha, the highest level of classical Arabic. When I studied Arabic in undergrad, if my instructor was unsure of a like, grammatical principle, he didn't reference a grammar text. He looked at how it was done in the Quran, and that's what we used. It is the standard of Arabic language. And in Jesus' day, Hebrew was similar. It was the standard language that would be used for prayer, how you would access God. But Jesus himself starts his prayer showing that there is no one sacred language to access God. He opens up prayer to all languages, and that later opens the door for scripture to be, itself to be translated across languages too. So for Jesus to start with Aramaic, the common language, is already a really big difference. But even more, he starts not with like a fancy honorific, but was saying father. Abba would be one of the first words a child would learn, like a dad or dada in English. It was the term you would use for an earthly father, or even as a term of respect for someone of a higher rank, like a student to a teacher. But Jesus isn't just saying God is like a father, that God is the father. He's using it as a title, using it to directly call God father. Jesus is defining a closeness of relationship between us and God. Scholar Kenneth Bailey puts it this way. This great Aramaic word affirms both respect in addressing a superior and a profound personal relationship between the one who uses it and the one addressed. It is easy to understand why the early church continued to use it even while praying in Greek. It invoked the quality of relationship the believer had with God through Christ. Jesus starts his model of prayer by telling us who God is to us. Father, a loving parent who can be known and talked to. And this directly confronts some of the core lies that we may hold about God, that God doesn't love us, that we can't trust God, that God is far away from us and our needs. And these lies go way, way back. In Genesis 2, God is referred to as Yahweh Elohim, or Lord God. But when the serpent comes to Eve, he just says Elohim, an abstract name for God. It's like when you, if you called someone only by their title instead of their name. Like if I referred just to Ryan and Megan as pastor, or if I said doctor instead of Alyssa or Ted or Margaret. It creates relational distance and steadily makes that person less knowable to me. Here, the serpent doesn't just say, hey, Eve, eat this fruit. 
He instead slowly chips away at her trust in God's character by distancing her from God and pushing her to question God's goodness towards her. And by referring to God in this way, the serpent makes God seem unknowable, untrustable, and distant. And it deceives even Adam in the end. They believe that God is not loving. And as they are made in God's image, it makes them believe that they are less than beloved too. In teaching us to pray Abba, Jesus calls us to remember who God really is and who we really are to God, a loving parent and a loved child. In his excellent book on prayer, Pastor Tyler Staten says this, when we call God our father, we are equally remembering that we are completely, uniquely loved. Until we know that love, nothing can be truly right within us. In using our father, Jesus not only creates intimacy instead of distance and opens up prayer to any language, he also opens up our relationship with God to every culture. The traditional daily prayers of Judaism include references to the temple, to the Torah, and the specific history of Israel. They're focused on a particular people in a particular place. But Jesus says we are no longer praying only to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but to our Father. Everyone has a father, and so everyone is welcomed in. And this is wonderful news for us, though it would have been scandalizing to those around Jesus at the time. And even as our father is such good news for us, we too can find ourselves scandalized by Jesus' choice of Abba. A common hang-up modern readers have is that this language can feel overly patriarchal to us. And in our current cultural moment, that can be very, very challenging for some people. For some, it may seem easier or more inclusive to simply remove such gendered language to avoid tripping anyone up. But that doesn't fix the issue the way that we hope it would. Throughout the Bible, God is described with many male metaphors, but there are also female and more abstract metaphors used to teach us about the character of God. Across church history, though, those latter metaphors have often been ignored or forgotten. We hear about kings, shepherds, and fathers kind of a lot, but less so about God as a woman in labor or as flame or as bread. And there are many, many beautiful and memorable metaphors for God throughout scripture. But unfortunately, culture and many church traditions have overemphasized some and completely forgotten others. To simply remove the male metaphors would also mean neutralizing the female ones. God as a laboring mother in Isaiah, or Jesus comparing himself to a mother hen as he grieved the fate of Jerusalem. Rather than making it more inclusive, trying to ignore or just remove this sort of gendered language also removes a layer of depth and richness in scripture. Instead, we can choose to expand our metaphors for God throughout scripture and wrestle with those that we find challenging, rather than simply pretending they're not there. A second challenge with our father is that it can be deeply impacted by our particular family history. If our experience of our earthly parents and caregivers is a painful one, it may be challenging for us to imagine a God who loves us unconditionally. Our family wounds can be especially deep and painful ones. And we don't suddenly forget those wounds when we start to follow Jesus. In my family of origin, I experienced a lot of instability and conflict between my parents growing up, with one becoming increasingly authoritarian and angry, and one withdrawing from us emotionally and physically over time. And much of this came out of struggles that they already had with trauma and unhealthy narratives and mental and emotional unhealth that they carried, and it impacted our whole family. As the eldest, I often had to step up as the third parent for my younger siblings when our actual parents were fighting or just dealing with their own stuff. And this shaped my view of what a parent is like for a very, very long time. And I held a narrative that you can only trust yourself to get things done. In my relationship with God, I would intellectually assent that God is good and trustworthy, but I definitely acted like it was all on me all the time. God has worked steadily on softening my heart here, teaching me to trust God and giving me examples of godly, trustworthy parents at really key moments in my life. And God has also been good to help me work on my relationship with my earthly parents. And even though those wounds are still there, and I won't pretend that they aren't, God can and does redeem our image of parenthood. It can be hard to say our father when our earthly fathers carry so much baggage. 
but by choosing to address God as father, Jesus is saying that God is the true definition of what fatherhood is, not your earthly parent. Rather than using the lens of our earthly fathers to recoil against a father God, Jesus is showing us that our father God is the true lens that we should actually use to understand earthly parenthood and the ways that our fallible parents may or may not live up to that. It may be hard now to see the good in our father, but I promise you that it's there. We can hold the hope of God's goodness and love towards us, even while our earthly parent relationships are challenging. And please remember that God's heart breaks for the pain that you've experienced and wants you to draw near to God and a loving community of Jesus followers to help you heal because we do not heal these kinds of wounds on our own. And Jesus isn't finished at our father either. Not only do we call God Abba, who we can be in relationship with, but Jesus says our father in heaven. God is not an ordinary earthly parent, but one above and around us who created everything and who has numbered the very hairs on our heads. We have relationship with a God who draws near to us and yet is in heaven, knowable and yet awesome and transcendent. Jesus doesn't tell us to forget one to celebrate the other, but to hold both the power and the love of God together in tension when we call out to God in prayer. Jesus follows this already incredible opener with hallowed be thy name or may your name be kept holy in a more modern translation. And this may sound just like stock religious language to us now, but Jesus is making a really powerful point here. In the ancient Middle East, names held a particular kind of significance. They were the access point, the way that you would truly know something or someone. In its simplest expression, the name of God is that point of approach where it is possible for humans to communicate with him. This idea comes from the ancient Middle East and is reflected in the speeches of Moses at the burning bush. There God speaks to Moses, who insists that he be told God's name. Because the assumption behind the story is that if Moses does not know God's name, he cannot communicate with God. The name is a summary of the essence of God. To know the name of God is to affirm that God is personal, that he can be known, and that revelation is always an act of God. And knowing the importance of holding God's name in our prayers, this line brings up an important question. Does God need us to make his name holy? And the short answer is no, he definitely doesn't. Throughout scripture, we see that God is the one who makes God's name holy, acting in history to save, rescuing the Israelites out of Egypt, maintaining them through exile, healing and caring for God's often wayward people over time. God acts to make God's name holy, not us. So why then does Jesus tell us to do this, to pray, make your name holy? We get a glimpse of this in Isaiah 6, when the prophet Isaiah sees an incredible vision of God's holiness. We read, it was in the year King Oziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And Isaiah's response to this amazing scene is dread. He realizes his deep uncleanliness in the midst of all of this perfection, and he just doesn't know what to do about it. But God does. An angel comes to purify Isaiah with a burning coal, making him holy in the presence of God. And then God calls Isaiah as a prophet to God's people to speak truth over them. In experiencing God's holiness, Isaiah is then made holy. And so when we call out to God to make God's name holy, we are expressing our desire and willingness to be made holy as well. Over and over again, the Bible affirms that because God is holy, God calls for God's people to be holy as well. In Deuteronomy 7, we read, For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. Colossians 3 says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And 1 Thessalonians 3 says, may he as a result make your heart strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. 
Jesus has now told us to pray to our Father God, who is both near to us and in the heavens, loving and yet holy. We are called to holiness, and yet, like Isaiah, we may be very aware of just how imperfect we and the world around us are. So how does this come together? Is it possible for God to both maintain God's perfect justice and holiness and yet still love us entirely? A few weeks ago, Megan Miller taught on the challenging and beautiful story of the prophet Hosea. God's call for Hosea was to marry a prostitute who returned to prostitution when she felt that Hosea could no longer provide the things she wanted, committed adultery, and then had to be bought back from slavery by Hosea. And this puts Hosea in a very difficult position. Does he choose to affirm justice and righteousness or love and mercy with his wife? And the story illustrates on a small scale the love and agony of God's posture towards us because God chooses to love us even when we reject God's love. As Hosea himself and his shattered happiness learned to know love as the indestructible force which could save even his lost wife, so Yahweh's holiness as the sum of his being must contain the creative love which slays but also makes alive again. God's love and holiness are intertwined. We call out to our Father, both loving and holy, who in turn calls us to love and be holy in God's image. Jesus tells us to say, make your name holy, not for God's benefit, but for ours. It's us who need to call out for God's demonstrations of holiness and thus express our desire to be made holy as well. And we may think that a desire for holiness is something that we just have to feel. Once we're on fire for God enough or like really feeling it, that desire will just come. But that's not always the case. Adoration is not always the overflow of our hearts. In fact, it rarely is. It is an act of rebellion against the empty promises of this world and of defiance in the face of circumstances. God doesn't need us to make his name holy or to remind him. We need the reminder, the call to worship and to hold God's place as the Lord of our hearts each and every day in defiance of a world that calls us to worship anything else. God is the only one worthy of our praise, of our worship, of our obedience and our adoration. And this is how Jesus calls us to open up our prayers, to remember who God is, remember who we are, be reminded of God's goodness and holiness. Before we pray anything else, Jesus says, remember your father who loves you, who is holy and will make you holy in his image. Let that be the foundation for your prayers. Pray like this, our father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. In his book, Praying Like Monks and Living Like Fools, Tyler Staten sums up the, these opening lines of the Lord's Prayer like this. Remember who God is, remember who you are, and remember who we are to each other. And as we go deeper on this prayer in the coming weeks, let this guide your reflection. First, remember who God is. Consider who you have assumed God to be up to this point. Is God angry, distant, noncommittal, kind? God is not offended by your honest searching here. God desires relationship with you and will not strong arm you into it. Honestly explore the baggage and lenses you bring to God as father. And in this process of sifting through what we bring and what Jesus is teaching us, remember and meditate on God's love towards us and God's holiness and how these come together. And second, remember who you are. When we remember God as our loving father, we can then remember that we are beloved children. We are loved at our very core. What scriptures or biblical imagery can you call upon to remind you of your own belovedness in God? And finally, remember who we are to each other. If each of us is a beloved child of God, a wayward son who expects little but is lavished with love and grace from our father, then we need to walk in the world remembering that that is true for everyone around us as well. How have you been ignoring or forgetting the belovedness of those in your life? Can you ask God for forgiveness and for theirs as it's needed? And how might God be calling you into greater holiness by extending his incredible love to those around you, even when it's hard? And spend time this week in prayer, repeating this first line of the Lord's Prayer, remembering who God is, 
who you are and who we are to each other. And Jesus knew that he was presenting some incredible new things, even in these opening lines. To a people ultra-focused on their own culture and history, he broadens the focus, inviting everyone in. In place of a sacred language and long titles, Jesus tells us to simply come before our loving Father. Our God is both near and in heaven, loving and holy, and God, Jesus calls us to hold this tension in our prayers. This big, complicated, holy, loving God is who Jesus teaches us to pray to, tells us we can draw near to, calls us to follow. And even as he presents the paradox of a perfectly holy God who chooses to love an often unholy, wandering people, Jesus knows what the solution is and will be. The cross, where justice is served and ultimate love is demonstrated in the same moment. And as we continue to dive more deeply into the Lord's Prayer and all it would have meant to Jesus' original audience and now to us, let us not forget who is teaching us. Emmanuel, God with us, where love and holiness come to meet us in person. Let's draw near to him. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you that we can draw near to you. We thank you for this incredible model of prayer that you teach us, even in open, these opening lines, to remember who you are, who we are, and who we are to each other, God. Remind us this week of your identity and of ours. Help us to hold that at the core of our being. And before we pray anything else, let us be settled and rest in that love and the knowledge of your holiness and love towards us, Lord. We love you so much, God. We praise you in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at damascusroadtucson.com.